very much. Uh, as Edgar said, we've known each other a long, long time. And one of the actual things what I found out is I just follow Edgar around. Uh, basically, I met Edgar 11 years ago. I followed him to Bernard. He became president of the student council, so I became vice president. He started pastoring a Quaker church, so I thought I should pastor a Quaker church. He moved to the Pacific Northwest, so I thought we should go to the Pacific Northwest. He came back to the Midwest, so we thought, eh, might as well come back to the Midwest. So I'm really just following him around. So hopefully next week he wins the lottery, and I'll just follow him into that. But really, as we walk in, as we go through some things here today, and I'm trying to figure this out, Edgar. It, it came off of your email, so if you could hook me up and get me back to my email, that'd be great. Um, one of the things, though, as, as I come to preach, I really believe that every time that we come together as a group, as we come together to worship, that God can do something supernatural. He can do something so amazing that this could be the most famous day in your history. Today could be something that you will remember for decades. Or today may be a subtle change that God makes in your life. But whatever it is, God can do a supernatural thing here today. If you came not thinking anything special could happen, if you came and said, ah, there's a guest speaker, or you came and you thought, well, it was hard for me to get out of bed this morning, you got to wipe that out. This morning can be something that is supernatural to you. Now, you can look up me and say, oh, hopefully he's good at preaching. But this is the thing that happens. 60% of preaching is me. Now, of course, 100% is God, but 60% is me, 40% is you. It really is. Preaching is a give and take. If you guys just go crickets on me, this isn't going to be very good, and it's going to be both of our faults. But if this is going to be good, we need a feedback, some back and forth. Now, normally people will give the amen, or that's good, that's right, and those are good. I love those. I use preach it, I use speak it, I use amen a lot. I say, oh, that's good, that's right, keep going. Those are the words I use. But Brad Lominick is a, is a leader, um, church leader for Catalyst, and he came out with 50 of them that you can use, and they're phenomenal. I challenge our launch team that if you ever work all 50 into one message, there will be confetti and balloons that come down from the ceiling. But here's five of them, and I encourage you to use them if you'd like to. Um, some of them, if you don't know social media, you won't get it. If you do know social media, you, hopefully you'll get some of them. If you know basketball, you'll know others. Uh, first one is, if I say something good, just yell, buckets. Or you can say, hashtag it. Or you can say, swipe to the right. You can say, onions, if you know Bill Raftery. Or you can do my personal favorite, put that on a plate and split it. I have no idea what that means, but if I'm preaching good, that's what you need to do. If it's just going downhill, help me with some of this stuff, and I promise you, it will get better. But as I said, we've, I've followed Edgar for the last 11 years of my life, but I want to give you guys uh, just a picture of who my family is. I want to give you guys a picture of my family. My youngest is hanging out with me uh, today, but you guys should have everything locked in. Um, there we go. And go forward one more here. I want to give you a picture of my family. My youngest one, the one up there that's trying to get away, he's with me. I actually got him to stay with me. He is Xavier. He is our four-year-old. Uh, my oldest is Ian. He got sick on Thursday night. That's why not the whole family is here. Uh, my wife, Aubrey, who puts up with a lot, but I assume she loves every minute of it because she sticks with us, and me. This is us in, in Yakima, Washington, right before we're moving back. But really, this is my family, and actually... Our boys are just a little bit younger than what Edgar and Denise and Adon and Edgar were when I met them over a decade ago. But this is my family. We have been in ministry for nine years. We've been pastoring for nine years. Uh, this is, we pastored in southeast Iowa. We pastored in Yakima, Washington for the last six and a half years. And now we are coming back to my hometown. My wife's a church planner's kid. Uh, she uh, grew up, uh, was born in downtown Milwaukee. Uh, Wisconsin. Her dad did a restart there. Then they planted a church in northern, north side of Minneapolis in the suburbs. Um, I grew up a welfare kid, uh, addict's kid, completely opposite than what my wife did. And only by God's grace, when he brought us together, uh, does this team work. We've taught each other a lot about God, but we come from drastically different situation. So if you look at me and go, ah, oh, he's just a preacher. He's probably had life pretty easy. That's not my story. And if you look at my wife, oh, she's a preacher's kid. She probably has an easy story. That's not 
her story either. God has done something radical in both of our lives. But this next chapter of our life is really a homecoming for us. I remember that God said it's time to go home, and that was a miraculous situation. That was something where my wife said, I'll never plant a church, and I said, I'll never move back to Marshalltown, Iowa. And here I'm speaking, saying we are planting a church in Marshalltown, Iowa. So that, of course, is how God works. But this morning as we walk through, I want to walk through, it's not just me asking for money. I I want God to work in this church life as he already is. I want him to have a word for me today for you guys. And as I was thinking through, as I was walking through our own story, I want to introduce you guys to maybe the most important homecoming in the history of the world. And here it is, and it picks up in the, in the book of Exodus early on in chapter 3, and you guys may know the name, you may not, but Moses is a shepherd. Moses is working for his father-in-law. Moses had a history where he thought he was going to be something, and now he's just washed up. He's washed up living the life that he thinks he's going to live far away from where he thought he would live his life. And I want to just walk through this story slowly. We're not going to give it all to you at the front side. We're actually going to just walk through, meander through, and we'll talk along the way. But if you'll turn with me to Exodus chapter 3 in the second, second book of the Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to hit the first verse, and that's it. We're going to stop after the first verse. If you have a Bible, great. If you do not, it will be up on your screen. But sitting in verse 1, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. You know, we all come in, if you know Moses at all, you're bringing a lot of information into the story. You're like, oh, this guy's a great leader. He's the one that led his people out of Egypt. None of that has happened here. We have to strip some of that away if we're going to look at this for really what's going on in Moses' life. We can't add what's going on in the future. Literally, right now, Moses works for his father-in-law. Anybody ever worked for their father-in-law? A lot of blessed people here. Not many people working for their father-in-law. But here he is. Grabbing onto his, hashtag it, there we go, buddy. See, you're getting the hang of it. He's working in here, and he's just a shepherd. Now, Moses has a lot going on in his background. He probably remembers Egypt quite a bit, but it seems so far away. He's, at this point, he's just a shepherd. Nothing special, nothing mighty. And the last thing I think that Moses is thinking about right now is going back to Egypt. Egypt was a chapter that he's moved far away from. He thinks he's home. He thinks he's where his heart is. This is where he met his wife. This is where he built his family. This is his new home out in Midian, out in the desert. But you know, the thing when we look at Moses, we can simply say, ah, he's just a shepherd. But Moses comes from the miraculous. If you know any of the story, Moses comes from the miraculous. As he was born, Pharaoh wanted to kill all the young boys, everyone two and under. It took a miracle just for Moses to be born. And then it took a miracle for Pharaoh's daughter to pull him out of the river. It took a miracle for Moses to grow up in his biological parents' home until he was four years old, learning the customs, eating the food, singing the songs before he was handed over back to Pharaoh. It took a miracle for that to happen. It took a miracle for Moses not to be in jail. But Moses didn't just come from miraculous beginnings, did he? There's a lot of messiness when it comes to the story of Moses. The fact, can you even imagine that from the moment you were born, people wanted to kill you? Can you even imagine what that does to your psyche? Can you imagine growing up apart from your family? And I know some of you have adopted and done foster care, so so you see that in your children. Maybe some of you have been adopted yourself, and you may know what this feels like. You know, but I think even the bigger thing is Moses knows that he killed someone. Moses has that guilt on his shoulders. Moses knew he was supposed to do something special for God. He was nowhere near that in his life. He was in a desert. I would say emotionally as far as physically. Yes, God had shown his grace. He did have a family. He had these things. But the reality is Moses probably thought what God wanted to do is no longer on the table. What God thought could happen is no longer on the table. What God was going to do was going to happen until he messed up. 
right? Anybody ever been there where you're like, oh, God could have done something, but I messed up seriously here and now I've ruined it all. Have you ever had that situation in your life? But you know what? Sometimes when we look at the Bible, we distance ourselves from the characters. We distance ourselves from the people we think, oh, these guys are supernatural. These are the heroes of the faith. These are people that are way better than I am. But I want to tell you, they're just people. They're just you and I that were obedient or at some points disobedient to what God has. And God just wrote his story on their life. So this is the reality. Just as it was with Moses, each of our past is a mixture of the miraculous and the messy. Each and every one of our stories comes from the miraculous. Each and every one of our stories come from the messy. And as I'm talking here today, this is what I define miraculous as. Miraculous is anything that happens to your life that you couldn't do for yourself. That may seem pretty minor, but I promise you we would not see the full grace of God if we didn't see the miracles in the minor things of life. The minor things become the major things. The minor things are the things that link them together. But each and every one of our past is a mixture of the miraculous and messy. No matter where you come from, no matter what you come from, this is true no matter what. And you may be miraculous. It may be a medical thing where you weren't supposed to be as old as you are today. I was in a very serious car wreck when I was three years old. It was a miracle I'm alive today. My dad said it knocked the stupid out of me, so thank goodness for parental support. Spiritual. You may come from, your parents may have really lived out faith in your home, where they said this is who Jesus is, and then you saw that Monday through Saturday. That's miraculous. That's something that not everybody gets. But a lot of us also are well aware of the messiness we come from, right? If it's just as simple as our mess-ups, our hang-ups, our our screw-ups, it's our sin, the things that we do against God. Or maybe it's somebody else's sin against you. Maybe your parents weren't who they should have been. Maybe your parents were caught in addiction like my mom was. Maybe your parents just didn't live out the life that you thought they should have. Maybe it was abuse. Maybe it's just addiction. Maybe it's adultery. Maybe you committed adultery. Maybe adultery was committed to you. Maybe you've been divorced. Whatever it is, you know you come from messiness. You know you come from baggage. And you wonder, what in the world could God use me for? I promise you that's what Moses felt in the desert. What in the world could God use me for? And this is why I believe so strongly that a healthy church has to have three chairs in it. Three types of people, because we all come from messiness, but we all come from miraculous, and God can use each and every one of us. The first chair is, this is what I would call, that God is an option. A church needs people that don't have it figured out, even when it comes to who God is. But they're open. They're open. Maybe Jesus is real. I'm open to the idea of God. That's the first chair. The second chair is, Jesus is my option. I may be new in my faith, I may not know how this all works, but I know it's Jesus, and now I'm just trying to figure this thing out. And I assume many of you are probably even in that seat, as you guys have grown here quite a bit over the last couple of years. And the third one is, God is my only option. I've walked with Jesus so long, he's been so good, the ups and downs of life does not scare me, because I know he is faithful. A healthy church has all of that, because it recognizes We didn't get to be Jesus is my only option because we're just better than other people. That's only true because God is so faithful. And that's automatically going to draw you to people stuck in messiness. One of the subtitles I'm kind of calling this is reigniting our heart for the mission of God. If If we all understand that we all come from messiness, we all come from the miraculous. We know that we're all broken, but there's something that God has done in us and he can do through us because that's who he is. That's the type of God he is. And I said a little bit about my story. Now that my parents were divorced at three, my mom did suffer from addiction for a lot, a lot of years. I was a welfare kid and I, my heart breaks for that. There are a lot of people that didn't think I would amount to much. There's a lot of people that knew I could amount to something and made sure that I got there. That's incredible. That's incredible. Charles Barkley uh, just recently said, a lot of people have done heavy lifting for me to get to where I am. The best thing I can do is not mess it up. That's one of my favorite quotes because it's so true. There is no such thing as a self-made man. 
There's no such thing as a self-made person, especially when it comes to faith. We all come from that messiness, but here's the miraculous. My dad married a woman in 1986 who became my stepmother and still is my stepmother, actually my mother today. She's been phenomenal. And she taught me what love was. She taught me what responsibility was. And the cool thing is my biological mother has even come to faith now. And it's an incredible story where she's going to join our church when we launch. And God is doing incredible things through her life. But the story of my stepmom interjecting into my life, she interjected from a church background, came to faith. My dad then comes to faith. And my history has changed. My legacy has changed because my dad said yes to Jesus because his wife said yes to Jesus. Even the messiness I come from was overrode by the miraculous that God can do. And then he gave me a pretty spectacular wife. And you can say amen to that, Edgar. She's pretty spectacular. So here's Moses. Here's a man stuck in the miraculous, stuck in the messy. He's just a shepherd. Don't put too much on him. He's just a shepherd trying to participate in his father-in-law's business. Let's move up the story as God starts to speak to him to re-engage in his mission and reignite that in his heart. And it says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Think of that. He's still in the back 40. He's doing what he's done day after day after day after day. I don't know, wherever you work, if you're working in a factory and you're just on a machine day after day after day after day, and all of a sudden God speaks to you, Uh, He says, you know, I better go check out this strange site. I'm thinking a lot more things in my mind than just that. I'm thinking, am I going crazy? That's first and foremost, am I going crazy? But Moses goes to check it out. Think of this. As Moses had just been a shepherd, here he had matured, here he had learned a lot of things. Even though he was just out in the wilderness, God was still prepping him. Even though Moses thought what God wanted to do in his past was over and done with, God's vision of what he was going to do with Moses had never changed. The desert was just as important as growing up in Pharaoh's house for Moses to move forward. I don't know where you guys are today, but you may look back fondly at your history and now like, I'm in the desert. That desert place is just as important. That desert place is just as important for what God wants to do in you and through you in the future. But here he is, he's just a shepherd, he's living his life, got his family, learning what it is to be a man even from his father-in-law. Later on, he still goes back to his father-in-law. Like, how do I do this? But he's just living life, one foot in the other, till on the back 40, and then something changes. And that something is simply, God shows up. That's all that has to happen for your life to be drastically different, is God to show up. And I believe that's where you and I can find ourselves. We are here, we're living, we're existing, we're walking to church every Sunday, hoping something will happen, and it just seems to be the same. All it takes is for God to say, Moses, Moses, and all for you to say, here I am. Here it is in a moment, and for you and I, God will give us monumental opportunities in the mundane of our everyday routine monumental opportunities. It doesn't take you being on the top of a roller coaster. It doesn't take you being a part of tons and tons of miracles where you always feel emotionally connected. It just takes an opening for God to show up in just the routine, mundane parts of life. I don't know about you, but that mundane opportunity might be in your office Monday through Friday. It may be at a church service. It may be today. This may be your famous day. It may be on a combine, it may be at the dining room table, it may be at a tree stand, or you may be like me, and it happened at a swing set. I have a picture here of Arnold Park. 
in Marshalltown, Iowa. It's on 7th and Lynn. It's a neighborhood park. It's a nothing park. It's, a half, it's just a quarter of a block. It's a half a block away from my grandma's house. I grew up going to that park. Now, that park looks kind of nice now, but when I was a kid, that was the metal rusty slide park, you know, where you have tetanus shots after you go there. The swings don't quite work right. The tilt-a-whirl, you're probably going to break something if you ever get on it. And then the basketball hoops that never had a net because it always got stolen, that's that park. But two years ago, August of 2013, Xavier, my youngest, and I were there with my sister and her youngest pushing on the swing. And I heard God clear as a bell say, somebody should plant a church in Marshalltown, Iowa. I was on vacation pushing my son on a swing, and my future changed. We loved the Northwest. We loved Yakima. We loved the church. God was doing things. It wasn't a bad ministry. People were getting saved. We even got to plant a church. Lots of great things were happening. And in a moment, God shifted my entire future. In, my, in a moment, God changed what I thought my future was going to be. But here's the reality. It's the same thing as anything. Is my vision of what my future will shifted when God sent me out to the Northwest. God's vision for my future never changed. His vision for me has been the same since he saved me. His vision for me has been the same since he called me. His vision for me has been the same since he said, go, be a leader of people for my glory. His vision has been consistent. His vision for you has been consistent. And as God sent, it wasn't just quickly, it was like, Aubrey, we're moving now. No, but when we left Marshalltown that day, we didn't want to leave. That had never happened in the history of my existence. At 31 years of life, I had never had that feeling when I left that town. And in a moment, God changed everything in me. That following July, when I was at the general conference, when all our churches from the entire denomination came together in Portland, Oregon, the first day, I was like, oh no. I'm supposed to be the one that plants a church. So I'm writing down notes as I like to do. I'm trying to ask myself questions of why I need to not do this and all that. Am I just doing this because I want to live by family? And as I kept writing it down, I was like, oh my goodness, I am supposed to do this. Now I've got to tell Aubrey, the person who will never plant a church. We found something out. Changing a culture of a church is far harder than creating a brand new culture. So we had lessened a little bit over the time. Yeah, just preaching a little bit of truth here. But as, as we did this, and then, of course, I said, all right, tonight I'm going to tell my wife. Now, anybody who has kids, you'll understand what I'm talking about. As a child, going to a hotel was fun. It was exciting. Not everybody had cable at home. It was nicer area. You had a pool. Then when you have kids and you have to stay at a hotel, it's the eighth layer of hell that Dante missed. So that night, I never got to talk to my wife about what he was doing. So the next morning, Russ Callenhoven, our our conference superintendent here, was preaching about the vision of the North Central Conference. My wife leaned over to me, and Russ is actually the only pastor she's ever had that wasn't her dad or her husband, and looked at me and said, I want to be a part of that. And right after I said, this is what we're supposed to go do. We're supposed to go plant a church in Marshalltown. These are two people that never were going to do any of that. She looked at me with a smile. Says, okay, let's do it. That's what God can do in a moment. That's what God can do supernaturally at one point. And when God starts to utilize you like that, you're like, oh my goodness, God is just sending me to a new level. My past is in the past. It will not connect. Now I have a new thing. Don't you perceive it? God is doing a new thing. We hear those verses. But here's the third thing that we see when we look at Moses. Moses says, original story wasn't completely disconnected what, with what he was going to do. God was actually sending him back to his past. Now, if you look at this, Moses tried to lead the people out years earlier. Forty years earlier, he tried to do it. He tried to do it under his own power, and what happened? He murdered someone and had to leave town. Forty years later, God is sending him back to do the same thing, but he now has a different power. He now has a different thing. There's something new happening in his life. And he's sending him back, not in human power, but in spiritual power. The Holy Spirit 
infusing and empowering him to go back and send his people out. And as we continue on the story, looking at verses 5, we're going to continue on here. It says, Do not come any closer, God says. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then, then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people the Israelites out of Egypt. God never gave up on Moses, never gave up on the Israelites, and his story was going to be told. Now, I don't know about you, a lot of times when I hear a promise of God, maybe you've not had this experience before, but something that you feel within your very bones that God is speaking to you, and then you walk out and it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. I, I will tell you this, I felt a very clear call nine and a half years ago about what I felt God was doing in our ministry, and we are just starting to scratch the surface of that. God has put us in deserts. Our first two years in Mount Pleasant, Iowa was the worst 25 months of my life. It there, I learned that we pastor because we are called, not because it's fun, not because it's joyous, not because you see fruit. You pastor because I told you to pastor. Then in Yakima, about for seven years, we were like, oh, this can be fun. We can have joy. People will get saved. Lives will change. Families will change. Churches will be planted. This is awesome. Something can happen. And now, just starting to scratch the surface with what I thought God said a decade ago. And that's what Moses is experiencing here. Moses had to be blown away. Moses had put all those ambitions, all those dreams, all those things in the rear view mirror. He thought those were gone. Has anybody of you, have any of you ever put those dreams, those passions, those thoughts that you thought that God could do something, but it hadn't happened for so long that you put them behind you? That you packed them away and said, well, maybe that's not my dream. God is incredible about bringing that back out years later after he has grown you, tested you, and reformed you and formed you into who he needs you to be god has not given up on that promise he has done and given to you already he is just making you ready to receive that promise and i think about this the first thing moses is like what not me you don't know my you have to know my story i murdered i went back i cannot go back to egypt i'm not the right guy send somebody else And here's how that story continues to unplay. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Wrong guy, wrong time. And God said, I will be with you. Here's the drastic shift of everything. I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Think of how incredible that is, because this is what you need to know, that God will use our entire story to reach those that are stuck in their messiness. God will use every ounce of your story to grab people that are caught in that messiness, that don't know who God is, that don't know that Jesus died for them, that don't know. They may know it in their head. They may have heard it. They may have seen billboards, but they don't know it. They have never seen it lived out in a way that draws people to accepting Christ as Savior. They have only heard rhetoric. They have never seen it lived out in life. God will use our entire story to reach those stuck in messiness. Here's something that we're building at the very core of our vision is that we are catalysts, not consumers. You do not sit in that seat to consume who God is. You sit in that seat so you can go and not only be used in you, but through you, that you are a catalyst to someone else's faith. Think about this. There are tons of people out there that are paralyzed by the messiness that they see around them. I am not kidding you. There are tons of people like my mother that was stuck in addiction, stuck in abuse, that didn't know that Jesus could restore that. She knew of him, but she did not know him. And there are people out there that are stuck and dying, and they just need a catalyst to come and speak to them and share Jesus with them. You are that person. There are people that are victims of abuse that don't 
even understand how God can be loving and secure. There are people caught in addiction that don't know that God can be powerful. There are people that are stuck in their own stuff that don't know there's life outside of them. You have that ability to speak into their lives. When I, just, when I felt God called me to go back to Marshalltown, there was a story that came up from the recesses of my mind. And it was me at age six. Walked in, my stepmom uh, went, grew up in a church. Uh, she did not find Jesus there. Uh, found religion there, but it was a mainline, main street type church, big monumental church. And, and I remember God gave me a story when I was six years old. Walking into, walking into Sunday school. And looking, there was a teacher and there was a teacher's son. As I walked in, now, remind you, I, I perceived life at that time. I'm an addict's son in welfare. I didn't feel like I was going to belong there. This is a really nice church. Everybody dressed up, all that stuff. So I did not belong already. I knew this. Walk into class and the teacher's son looks at me and says, What are you doing? You don't belong here. God brought that story back up and he said this. You go make a church where you belong there. And in those moments, in that story, God broke in me something that I didn't know could be broken. I thought I loved people that didn't know Jesus. I was a person that did not know Jesus, but I did not know the depths of my call to reach people that don't know Jesus. It wrecked me something fierce, and I am so happy it did. And then God finalized this calling with an Erwin McManus quote from his book, Barbarian Way. You guys need to own this, digest it, ingest it, keep it, hold it. You will be a catalyst, not a consumer, if you grab a hold of this. And he says, we look to Jesus not to fulfill our shallow longings or provide for us creature comforts. We look to him to lead us where he needs us most, where we can accomplish the most good. For me, that's Marshalltown, Iowa. For you guys, it's Woodbury County. You guys are a multi-community ministry that has its center in Moville. You're not a Moville church. You're bigger than that. How incredible is that? I've already asked Edgar, how do I become a multi-community church? He's given me some great stuff. You know, as I last shared this in November, this was all philosophy. This was all thinking ahead. But I have a couple minutes here, and I just want to share with you some of the stories of our launch team. In December 17th, we moved to Marshalltown, Iowa. Restore Church was four people. See, I've been in ministry of subtraction. That was Mount Pleasant where we just lost people. I lost my pride and we lost people. It was a great time. <laughs> Yakima was a ministry of addition. Marshalltown is turning out to be a ministry of multiplication something that you guys are starting and have experienced here, that God is doing something supernatural. In December, we were at four. We are nearing 30 people now, and we were hoping to be here by the end of March. We hit our goal of the end of March in the middle of February because we showed up, and God had been there for a long time. We did not bring God with us. God said, see all this work. I will tell you, one is a couple that are moving with us that have been in ministry for 10 years that are looking for something that they can be a part of and own and actually be a part of a movement. They are giving up their life and moving to Marshalltown, Iowa for that. There's another young lady named Molly. She's 31, grew up in church, did not who know really she was a good church girl, but this active participant personal relationship with Jesus didn't happen until she was 28. And for the last three years, she's been consuming Jesus. She says, I've got, she actually drives 40 miles outside of Marshalltown to consume Jesus. She says, I already invest in my community during the week. I need to be a part of the church that invests in my community. Another couple that I went to school with, I was actually on their first date. She has not consistently gone to church for 10 years when her dad was the pastor and passed away after an illness he picked up doing mission work in Africa. And her father was one of the key people that said, Marshalltown, something big is going to happen a decade ago. And she and her family, she has not raised her kids in church because she was mad at God and she had missed her father. Others that have been saved for the last 15 years and just found, we are not doing anything for the lost. We need to be a part of people for the lost. Other people that never grew up in church don't know who Jesus is, but says, you know what? We'll be a part of your launch team. People that don't know Jesus, learning about Jesus, 
with people is a really good thing. He says, I don't know if we could ever go to church. I've got a big neck tattoo. We don't know what it is. We don't know where to go. We know nothing about it, but we're open to it. They're a part of this team. We have people moving from the Twin Cities to make this thing happen. God is showing up. I don't say this to say, look how great I am. It has nothing to do with me. I've been in ministry long enough to know this is not a Dylan thing. Maybe 10 years ago, if I would have got it all at once, this would have been a Dylan thing. Now it is not a Dylan thing. We do need your partnerships. Like Edgar said, prayer is huge. Prayer is, and you know, that may sound like lip service, it is a really big deal. We have, we have intercessory teams. There's a prayer task force in Marshalltown that I believe single-handedly shifted the culture five years ago by intentionally praying over the community, and there are practical facts to back that up. So if you want to do that, we encourage you to put your email address on here. The second way you can partner with us is a one-time partnership of money. And and if you look at the bottom, it tells you to please make all commitments to the North Central Conference. Write that in the line if you're using a check, and then write Restore Church in the memo line. But you can give one time, or you can give monthly, and we're asking for a year. Monthlies are great because you're consistently with us. We just encourage you to put that number in there. We have it all set up. All you have to do is hand this in. We've got a really slick setup where you will hear from us within just a day or two and give you all the steps of how to set up monthly giving. Um, But if you would please partner with us in one way, I promise you people are already hearing about the gospel. I get to speak at another, at a community rally this upcoming Saturday just because of what God's already done. This is the second time I've been able to speak in front of a city I've been to for two months. And it's not because of anything I'm doing. God is opening up the storehouse. I'm testing him and he's saying, oh, this is way bigger than you ever thought it could be. So we really ask if you guys would just partner with us. I'm going to invite Pastor Edgar to kind of uh, give you the nuts and bolts of how to do that. But Uh, Again, just want to thank you guys so much for your time, and you guys did well. Uh, You guys picked up your 40% of the deal. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, We've got about five minutes. Wow, what an awesome message. Uh, It's amazing what God does when we allow him to speak to our hearts, and then we listen. And I know that God has spoken to a lot of you guys. And you know what, Uh, Dylan, everybody that's here, I, I think I think I could say everybody that's here, God is called here. Uh, a lot of them have come come from different towns, some of them from different ministries, but they're they're here because they feel this is where God is going to use us to do whatever it is that He's going to have us do here, to you know the the movement that we're a part of. Um, as you were talking, uh, the restoration and all that cool stuff, uh, I couldn't help but think about a ministry that that we're involved in, and it's kind of low key right now, but. Uh, man, I'm I'm really hoping that that we partner all of us together, not just our name, New Hope, with this with this organization, but it's Atlas of the Valley. Uh, they're doing an amazing job, an amazing amazing work. Hashtag that uh, amazing job in our community, and so that's that's who we are. So it's it's awesome that we're here and they're there, and we're we're partnering to, to do the same the same thing. So I'm gonna go out on a limb, and on March the 15th. I'm going to ask the director to tell us all about it, to come speak to us here on the two services. And the director's here. I'm not even going to look that way right now because I'm just going on. But I am going to pray and, and, ask, and ask her officially tomorrow, so be ready. I'm going to ask you tomorrow uh, to share on the 15th here at our church. Um, so, ushers, would you come? And if you have, uh, if you need a pen, raise your hand and we'll get you a pen. But uh, could you please... Uh, fill this out and tell Dylan our one-time gift and or we will be praying for you because I I kid you not uh, that's one of the churches that we're gonna soon look up to and say wow you know okay show us how to do that because we we need to get there Uh, that that's that's what God I feel God's gonna do over there in Marshalltown with this family Uh, so let let me let me uh, pray for the offering and if uh, uh, if you don't get this card in there you know, obviously, there's still time you can hang around and fill it out and then just give it to myself, to Dylan, uh, and, and we'll make sure it gets to the right place. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for an incredible message, um, Father God, of just uh, being obedient to your calling uh, and, and the, the possibilities, Father God, when we say yes to you. Uh, it, it, it's not just changing 
the mind of one person, Father God, but it's changing, it's changing a culture in our society uh, to learn that you are bigger than us, that we do have a loving God that we can trust, that, that, uh, that has a plan for us. Father God, it doesn't matter what background we have, where we come from, what we've done, Lord, but that you will restore us uh, the moment that we ask you into our hearts to be our Lord, to be our Savior. Father God, thank you so much for the way that you've used all of us, the way that you're bringing us together still, Father God. And I know that we're just in that season. Uh, Father, I just feel like we haven't even begun, that you're still bringing the right people uh, to this team, to this church, Father God, to, to go and, and do great works in this, in this, uh, in this county and in, in the surrounding counties in Siouxland. Uh, Father God, that's what I'm claiming. I'm claiming Sioux land for you, Father God. So, Lord, use us all uh, for your kingdom. Lord, and may we make an impact in your name. And I pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Bless the offering, Father God. Amen. Um, musicians, all right. You guys want to close this with, uh, as we do this? And, uh, and then we will see you guys next week. Don't miss out next week. We've got our very own Micah Gitlin. Uh, this lady is kind of in love with him. That's playing the, the, the keys. And uh, he, uh, I've already talked to him. So he's going to bring a, an awesome message. And uh, so, so let's support him next week.